Good evening and welcome to Primetime Lawmakers for February 9, 2011, the 12th legislative day of the 2011 session of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Scott Slade. Coming up in tonight's program, the House tables a bill requiring driver's license exams be given in English only. Sunday alcohol sales jump another hurdle as the House version of the bill clears committee. Governor Nathan Deal accepts a $37 billion check, but he shouldn't head to the bank just yet. It represents the economic impact of Georgia's ecological resources. We continue our leadership interview series tonight. Agricultural Commissioner Gary Black will join us and we'll be going in depth on pre-K education. I'll be joined in studio by Education Advocates Representative Judy Manning and Representative Steffi St Stephanie Stuckey Benfield. All that is coming up tonight on Primetime Lawmakers, but first, the House debates whether Georgia residents should be required to take driver's license exams in English. Yawandi Lawson joins us live from the Capitol with the latest in House Bill 72. Good evening, Yawandi. And good evening to you, Scott. Over an hour of floor debate today on a measure that would eliminate the option of taking the state driver's exam in one of 14 languages. But with opposition from both Democrats and Republicans, the measure is finally tabled this afternoon. Atlanta Representative Scott Holcomb argued that 12 years in the military gave him firsthand experience with driving in a country without being fluent in its language. While I was in those other countries, I didn't speak those native languages fluently. I learned enough to get by, just as many of the drivers here in Georgia do. For example, when I was in Germany, I knew enough to know that Ausfahrt meant exit. And I'm sure that the German drivers that come here know enough to know that exit means Ausfahrt in their language. And they're able to uh, work through it and to drive safely. I'm aware that our Commissioner of Economic Development uh, Chris Kaminsky is opposed to this legislation. Now, why is he opposed to it? I think a big reason, I'll speak for him, but I think if he is a commissioner representing the state of Georgia and goes to foreign businesses and foreign dignitaries and talks about wanting to encourage them to come here, and the word will go out, this bill becomes law, that we are not encouraging these people to have their businesses and their opportunities placed in this state. I would encourage you to vote no on all the amendments. I would encourage you to vote yes for the bill. If you believe, uh, Chairman Wendell Willard, and we are, we will work together on other bills. We disagree on this one. But his whole case was on the fact we would have never done this in the year of the Olympics. Yet it was in the year of 1996, the year we had the Olympics here, the whole world, that this General Assembly said English is the official language of the state of Georgia. And didn't we have a great Olympics? And did it affect any of our businesses negatively? Certainly no. And so that logic does not hold water. One amendment that was adopted came from freshman representative B.J. Pack, who argues that only the signed portion of the exam must be given in English. I respectfully submit that English proficiency or fluency does not necessarily mean that the person knows how to drive safely or safer than any other person who is fluent. Thus, I believe my amendment addresses that issue because it requires that the signage test include language which would alert them uh, of some things that are common in our digital billboards. Now, despite Representative James Mill, the bill sponsor's admonition, Representative Pack's amendment was adopted. Since that bill, uh, supporters claim that that would effectively gut the bill, they successfully rallied to table the matter. That vote sends HB 72 back to the House Rules Committee, where it can be brought back into play any time. Governor Nathan Deal says he agrees with the bill's sponsors that there are some common sense approaches to offering an English-only driver's license exam. I have generally supported the idea of English only because uh, that is our, our language that is acknowledged. Uh, I know that there are circumstances that people are concerned about in terms of foreign visitors, companies that come in. But what I have seen in terms of we have a fairly liberal temporary driver's license that has a rather long duration for it that uh, I think will accommodate most of those immediate concerns. Another driver's license measure was given a hearing by the House Motor Vehicles Committee this afternoon. House Bill 7 would allow anyone to drive in Georgia without a license. Representative Bobby Franklin explained that the Right to Travel Act would not prevent the regulation of traffic offenses like DUI. Whether you have a driver's license or not, you're still subject to the DUI statute, the crime of DUI. And whether you've got a driver's license or not, uh, would would not change that that particular statute. How are the police officers 
then identify the individuals that they stopped? Well, they would identify uh, individuals the same way they did before government issued papers. And how did they do that? You know, hate as answering a question with a question, but what was the need when, uh, when, how did they know that it was Jesse James that robbed the bank? Uh, he, I don't think he had, had his state issued papers. The House Motor Vehicle Committee took no action today on HB 7. The House Regulated Industries Committee today, however, gave unanimous passage to House Bill 69, a measure allowing voters to decide whether alcohol can be sold by retailers in their areas on Sundays. The economic impact for our retailers is only making the playing field fair. Restaurants currently have the ability to allow the people to decide in their communities, and we're just asking for the same thing. Noticeably absent when the Companion Sunday Sales Bill was passed out of Senate Committee, one representative of the religious opposition weighed in today. We've continued to see encroachment on the Lord's Day uh, with all of these kinds of issues that we have faced. Uh, and indeed, the cat is out of the bag, and uh, we're seeing this happen across our state. And there's great concern uh, in regard to what this will do, even when we come down to the local level, uh, the fact that... Um, uh, those who feel the other way and feel like that we need to stop the encroachment on this day, uh, that uh, they could be, of course, outvoted. And it's not that we're, we're trying to close them out. We, we all have our opinion about this. And our opinion, our feeling is that this is something that needs to stop at this point. The House Regulated Industries Committee doesn't see it that way. The, the issue before us is simply this. Are we going to give Georgians the right to decide whether or not their community's groceries, convenience, and package stores can join their community's bars, restaurants, and certain athletic venues in selling alcohol on Sundays. And for that uh, reason, I believe that the majority of Georgians certainly want the right for their voices to be heard. And uh, for that reason, I'm going to make a motion that we do pass this uh, bill. There's a motion to pass House Bill 69. Is there a second? Second. As amended. There is a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of passing House Bill 69 as amended, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion leaves this committee with due pass. HB 60 now now goes to House Rules. And in other news, Governor Deal today called for Georgia to increase its role as a leader in the biomass industry. We recognize the tremendous economic impact that the forest industry, at both those large and small uh, tree owners all across our state have on our overall economy. To the tune of $37 billion in ecological resources, according to research done by the University of Georgia. But the Georgia Conservancy encourages that the discussion not be reduced to mere dollars and cents. Whenever we look at a tree, we think of more than just how much money it'll produce. We think of the spiritual value of the trees, which have been with us since the Garden of Eden. And so, we have to also consider the intrinsic value of trees as well as the economic value. They add so much to our lives as has already been uh, stated by some of the other speakers. But I think that it's a good thing for us to look at, at this issue from both perspectives and to manage our forests in a way that permit us to uh, keep it a vibrant and important economic industry and also to protect the uh, intrinsic and spiritual value of the trees that Almighty God created and put here on this earth. The thing that always resonates with me is that urban forest canopy out there. If those trees disappeared tomorrow, the quality of life here in the metropolitan area would deteriorate rapidly. I don't even know if you'd be able to breathe the air. The air quality would deteriorate so fast. I also asked those forestry advocates whether they are keeping an eye on the immigration bills that are moving through the General Assembly in that, like other agriculture, many forestry jobs are filled by foreign workers. Particularly to our nurseries uh, who require a lot of migrant workers in order to get their, get their nurseries planted and get their nurseries harvested and so on and so forth. Uh, that's, that is one area where uh, I'm hearing from my members a lot. Um, also, uh, in tree planting, uh, where we go in and reforest after we do a final harvest on a piece of property, 
migrant workers are very important there. So we are, uh, we are engaged and we are concerned about that. Uh, we understand the need uh, to uh, better regulate uh, illegal immigration, but at the same time, and very much like the governor said, we have to be careful that in the process uh, we don't do damage to a very, very important part of our economy. And like other agriculture lobbyists, Mr. McWilliams told me that his industry favors a federal solution to immigration reform, one that allows temporary workers to enter the country legally and without great cost to employers. Reporting live from the Capitol, I'm in Wandy Lawson for Primetime Lawmakers. Uh, if we can get back to something in Wandy, the UGA study finds that the forest industry contrib contributes $37 billion in ecosystem services. That's a big number. What exactly does that mean? It is a very large number. That check was pretty big, too. The researchers came to that amount. Scott, based on the, their research about the contributions to clean air and water, biodiversity, and also other habitats uh, that are maintained based on that 22 million acres of privately owned forest land here in Georgia. And Wandy, sure appreciate that report. Thanks so much this evening. All right, thank you. The year Tommy Irving was elected Agriculture Commissioner, the USA was landing on the moon and Jimi Hendrix was headlining at Woodstock. On Monday, Wandy Lawson visited Irving's replacement, Commissioner Gary Black of the Department of Agriculture, where he says many changes are underway. I'm real, very proud of our food safety team who on the, the day of the, the week of the, the ice, the week of the inaugural week, uh, we had our food safety professionals uh, at home uh, taking FDA courses online and that was a management decision within our uh, within our team and uh, I'm so proud of those folks that saw the opportunity they knew that we're going to be expecting more of those kinds of uh, management decisions to be made at the supervisory level and so uh, uh, that's just one one glimpse of early on uh, we, we're seeing some, uh, a new day here and, uh, and I'm just so proud of our team I would also uh, technology is a, is, is a big part. Uh, uh, I, I hope soon that uh, you're going to always talk to some, talk to good fresh faces and good fresh voices at this department, but uh, we don't have a voicemail in this building. And, and there, there's some little simple things like that that uh, can help us be better servants because I, I want you, I don't want to hear if somebody just the phone just ring, so ring, you, ring. So the Department of Agriculture does not have voicemail. There's right? not a voicemail here. <laughs> And so we're, uh, we're, we're, we're rapidly uh, ramping up our IT uh, capabilities, hopefully looking into a, um, a, a much better and uh, uh, brighter presence on, on the web, uh, having those uh, consumer education services that, uh, you know, I'd like to have for us to have a wide range of uh, you know, the consumer and food safety information that can be more readily available. We're, we're ramping up our Facebook and Twitter in that regard. Mine will, uh, of course, we were pretty active in the campaign long about it with those technologies. Uh, my, my personal Twitter and Facebook is going to be revamped this week. So across the street under the Gold Dome, of certainly one of the issues is immigration this year. And I'm wondering what role do you see for the Department of Agriculture as it tries to balance the needs of farmers and also, of course, being a state agency? Right. Well, jurisdictionally, we don't have any relationship there. So it's, uh, I'll leave that to those folks that do have the direct involvement. But certainly uh, agriculture, uh, the producers of this state need a legal workforce. Uh, we need the federal government to step up and do their job to provide that and uh, the, the, the framework in the future. And I certainly hope that they'll be that they'll do that because uh, it's uh, to continue to go down this road the way we are now is very irresponsible from the federal side. And I uh, I'd admonish uh, our leadership at every level uh, t to help us with that because we've we've got to have a uh, you know a documented legal. Uh, uh, workforce and, and, and that's going to be best handled at the federal level. We often think of agriculture as being something that takes place in the rural communities but you have uh, been interested in urban gardening as well. Uh, Councilman uh, Kwanzaa Hall from Atlanta City Council is a good friend. We've, we've built some bridges uh, here recently that I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. He, he has a deep passion for agriculture and, and so to have a friend at the uh, Atlanta City Council that they can help us advocate uh, for that is is, uh, is I look forward to partnering him with, with him over the course of this uh, this spring to promote the some of the urban gardens that he has interest in and um, I, I just think it opens up a great opportunity not only for just production but I, I can tell you and Wandy there are many uh, agricultural career opportunities for young people 
that uh, at our colleges are of agriculture at the uh, University of Georgia and Fort Valley State and ABAC and Tifton, uh, there are some tremendous opportunities for young people uh, because, uh, and I'm hoping that the, the, you know that's going to be part of the message is is uh, is we 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 work cooperatively on these kinds of issues is to open some of these doors for young people that may never have seen agriculture as a career before and uh, not just not just production but you know how does food get in a can what who who made the label who uh, who created the the vision for the marketing campaign all of that is a component of Georgia's 65 billion dollar agricultural industry and, and, and I think there's a lot of people in Councilman Hall, Hall's uh, district uh, that, uh, that could benefit from that. The department is also interested in reducing childhood obesity. So I'm wondering kind of what does that initiative look like and, and how are you tackling that? What we're going to be busy hopefully building the framework this year is, is an opportunity for some, some pilot communities to sit down, to bring their County Farm Bureau together, to bring their County Cattlemen's Association, their parent-teacher organization, their, their, their uh, school nutrition folks in, in the schools, and to look at the proposition of what does it take to feed my school for a week? Would it be possible within this county to produce a substantial amount of product if you properly plan that out uh, and, and actually feed our students from w within the confines of our county for a week. Now that means beef, it means chicken, it means fresh vegetables, it may be some vegetables we could can at other times of the year there, and, or freeze and have an opportunity maybe for communities that, that produce one thing that maybe could barter with others that, that produce something else just to create a, a sense of a, first of awareness of nutrition education. We have a great network of family and consumer, consumer science teachers across this, uh, programs across this state that could work on the nutri nutrition side. Our ag educators could work on the production side. Our science folks, we, uh, my wife teaches a food science course. She's a home economist. But uh, that could be in food preparation, food processing, all of it becomes an intercurricular activity. Uh, that, that could be very valuable to our students, once again, opens up career opportunities for them. So it's a, it's, I, I see it as more than just nutrition. Nutrition's a part of it, but I think it's a great opportunity for if we, if we can uh, launch Feed My School for a week uh, over the next year or two that, uh, and have some pilot communities that will step up and we, we have a framework for them to work under, I think it could be great for our state. Moving ahead, getting voicemail the Ag Department. Gary Black uh, heads the State Department of Agriculture. I want to correct a, a, a graphic that we had earlier this evening, misidentifying Representative Wendell, Wendell Willard. I'd like to apologize for that. There's more to come tonight of primetime lawmakers. After this short break, we'll be talking pre-K education with Representative Judy Manning and Representative Stephanie Stuckey Benfield. You think this is an important issue? Ask any parent who's camped out all night to get a slot in Georgia pre-K. Stay with us. GPB Sports Central with me, Gil Tyree. I'm Mark Harmon. I'm Nikki Noto. And I'm John. GPB Sports. Sorry. Nikki Noto. And I'm John. GPB Sports. Shoot. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. Too soon. I'm Nikki Noto. GPB Sports Central. My bad. And I'm John. GPB Sports. Uh, so close. Not even close. Seemed close. And I'm John. No GPB Sports Central, the leader in high school sports. On Georgia Traveler, get revved up in Madison at the world's largest microcar museum. Journey to Thunderbolt for a dazzling puppet show that celebrates a few of Savannah's past and present faces. Step back in time to Milledgeville and explore the politics and personalities of Georgia's Civil War capital. Hit an upscale restaurant that serves farm-to-table cuisine with a tongue-in-cheek twist. And travel 220 miles from Barnesville to Jekyll Island for the annual Peaches to the Beaches Yard Sale. Friday at 8 on GPB. Welcome back to Primetime Lawmakers. We turn now to tonight's discussion topic, pre-K education. The state of Georgia serves approximately 84,000 kids at its pre-kindergarten programs, which are available in all 159 counties. Proponents of the program say pre-K has a direct impact on early educational development, particularly in reading ability. Recently decreased lottery funds have threatened the program. A FY 2012 budget proposal would cut state-sponsored pre-K significantly. I'm joined here tonight by two education advocates from the General Assembly to talk about what happens next. Representative Judy Manning of Marietta is the chair of the House Children and Youth Committee. 
Representative Stephanie Stuckey Benfield of Atlanta is a longtime education advocate in the General Assembly. Thank you both for being here. Sure appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. This is a hot topic, and as I said before the break, if you don't think it's hot, ask any parent who's camped out to get a slot in Georgia pre-K. Uh, are we in trouble here with pre-K? Is the funding about to get to the point where people are going to be fighting for those slots instead of just camping for them? They're already fighting for them, but I, I hope we're not in trouble as far as the funding. It's the best buy you can get in the state of Georgia for education. Mm -hmm. I am concerned about the cuts. I've heard differing numbers, but I think the latest number is $20 million in cuts to pre-K. And we're faced with some bad options if that is indeed the case. Either uh, not fully funding the current 84,000 slots, mm -hmm. uh, increasing the already large waiting list, which is 10,000, mm -hmm. cutting the school day is one proposal I've heard. Uh, so I think that we need to make a commitment, frankly, not to have any cuts to pre-K. I think I the, second that. the budget okay. is a moral document, and we need to prioritize our children, and we need to prioritize l early learning. And w we can find the money. We can fully fund pre-K. I'm, well, I'm curious about that because, first of all, uh, it, it's all it's, it's strictly funded by the lottery, right? Right. At this point. That's yes. correct. What, what percentage of the lottery money that goes to education goes to pre-K? A little under 30%. Yeah. Okay. 30%. Which so, I, I contend it actually should be reversed. I think HOPE should be getting 30% and pre-K should be getting the bulk. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I really up. do. I will be happy with 50-50. 50-50. Well, you know, some educators are reluctant to say that a dollar spent on pre-K has more impact than a dollar spent on the HOPE scholarship. Why does a dollar on pre-K have more impact, or does it? Well, there are longitudinal studies that right. show, done in uh, other states, unfortunately there's not one in Georgia, but there are ample studies to show that uh, children who've been tracked from age five forward mm -hmm. Uh, there is reduced teenage pregnancy, there's a greater likelihood of completing high school, and most importantly, uh, these students go on to get jobs, become tax-paying citizens, and become productive members of our economy. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Judy. I That's all right, you and I are right on on that. <laughs> well, we're talking about money, though, and, and right now it's just funded by the lottery. Is there some noise uh, going on under the Gold Dome that says, well, maybe we need to find money somewhere else, some general education funds, for instance? I, well, I don't think there are enough funds in general education to fund pre-K as well, but I think people need to realize for every $1 we spend, we get $17 in, in really return, return on investment. And, you know, we've got uh, about $61,000 uh, 61, jobs that are related to pre-K, mm -hmm. and then we've got an additional 12,500 jobs that are related on the second tier. So there are a lot of people employed by pre-K, and a lot of money is generated through pre-K, and it's, like I said, the best buy you could get for the dollar. 1 to 17, that's interesting. That's a huge ratio, and we talked about jobs directly inside pre-K. Does it bring jobs into Georgia? The well, it's in 159 counties, so well, I would say yes. Families move here for it, for instance. Well, we, 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 have a, we have one of the best programs in mm -hmm. the whole United States. In fact, I think we're third. What happens in a pre-K classroom? And I'm going to hit you with a zinger here. Is it glorified daycare? I, no. Well, I would love to speak to that personally because I have a child who's currently in a state-funded lottery pre-K program, and it is not at all glorified child care. In fact, there was a recent national uh, quality study done, and Georgia met eight of the ten benchmarks for quality pre-K. So... Uh, my personal observations are backed up by the experts who actually go in the classroom and study these based on national standards. But my daughter is learning to count to 100. She is writing complete sentences. She is speaking Spanish. She is learning her shapes and her colors. Uh, it is a real curriculum, and mm -hmm. the teachers are extremely qualified. What They're certified. And certified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are certified. What does that do for their future experience? Uh, let's face it, kindergarten... Ain't what it used to be. It wasn't when I, I mean, kindergarten oh, was playtime yeah. when I was in kindergarten. I went it's to not little, anymore. Yeah, and now kindergarten is more like what we used to call the first grade. Is, pre, is pre-K key to a successful kindergartner and a, even a successful third grader? You guys it, seen that? It's absolutely imperative that a kid get a good start with, with pre-K in order to go to school. And in fact, if you want them to read on the third grade le reading level, you really need to have pre-K to give them that, that push and that start so that they can read on the third grade level, so they can continue through high school, so they can comprehend what they're reading and they can go on to college or whatever vocation they care to go to. Now you mentioned third grade, that, that, that's a pivotal year? 
third grade reading test is supposed to be very pivotal. And that's the beginning of, uh, uh, of AYP, too, mm -hmm. the AYP standards. And that's also when the CRCT tests start kicking in and determining whether or not you advance up. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is a critical year. And you were about to add something which you Oh, said. just that the, uh, the brain development is so critical at those early ages. And mm -hmm. you don't have to be a neuroscientist to know that those synapses are forming. And if you don't uh, educate a child at those early critical years, you're going to lose some of that brain functioning. You mentioned funding from other areas, possibly. You know, we talked about education funding is not enough for education right now anyway. Where's it going to come from? Where's the money going to come from? Do you see a, a point where some parents, especially those who are able, pay something? You know, I looked at a statistic on that recently uh, that showed that uh, the majority of parents who are in pre-K right now in Georgia earn less than $40,000. Right. So the numbers just don't work. It sounds good. It might make a good policy decision, but numbers wise, talking to the budget experts, uh, it just wouldn't be sufficient to fund the program. And I, Go ahead, Judy, sorry. Well, I think you have to realize that most of your low income already have Head Start, but we have promised a universal pre-K kindergarten just like we have in, in college for, for hope. So I think it's, it's our promise, it's our commitment to the kids of Georgia that we give them this opportunity. And the, the difference in the price for a college education versus pre-K, I mean, mm -hmm. we're only spending $4,000 per child. 4200 more or less, and it's down to that point. Is yeah. there a point where we're going to get below that and private providers who are part of the system who are being paid by the state to do this, are they going to start pulling out, kind of like Medicaid doctors or Medicare well, doctors? Well, private, oh, no, no, no. private doesn't have the same criteria that pre-K has. Okay. They have their own, they have their own criteria area and that the parents pay. I, w I was talking about some private entities oh. that contract to the state to help provide the, the pre-k program. I have so. heard some concerns from the private providers mm -hmm. about not getting uh, fully reimbursed for their costs. So there is that concern, most well, certainly. Well, to keep it alive, you mentioned the term universal just mm -hmm. a moment ago. Mm -hmm. uh, tell people what that means, universal pre -K. It means it's offered to every child in Georgia. Regardless first, of family income. Uh, right, uh, regardless of family income on a first come, first serve basis. Does that mean we need to have means testing to make sure it survives for those who need it most, who need the help the most? By means testing, I mean mm -hmm. salary caps, whether or not you qualify for fully funded PK, your family. I don't, I don't really think so because the, every child needs a chance and mm -hmm. every child needs that opportunity. And there's some places in South Georgia with, with, with the Georgia pre-K is the only place they have to go. There are no privates. So it's the only place, the only opportunity they have. So uh, I would say universal is what we, we'd aim, aim for anyway. I share Judy's commitment to universal pre-K. I think that's been a fundamental tenant of our pre-K program since it was founded in 1993. And we should continue with that original vision set by Zell Miller. I do think we need to look at general funds. That was a point you raised earlier. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's the direction we do need to consider in the long term. I also would like to see us uh, discontinue uh, programs like uh, the private school tax credits, uh, which currently cost the state budget $60 million. I would love to see those dollars go to pre-K instead. All right. Well, in the few seconds we have left, what would you like to happen in this session to help make this happen? Everybody buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Great point, absolutely. But fully fund pre-K and fully retain our, our commitment to the current 84,000 slots. I'd love to see us Have at least dip into that waiting list. Here. Start okay. dipping into that waiting list and right. commit, continue our commitment to universal pre-K. Thank you both for being here. It's been an education in more ways than one and always is. We'll follow the issue with you. Thank Th you so thank much you so for much. having us. That's all the time we have for this evening. Thanks for joining us. Coming up tomorrow on Primetime Lawmakers, the House is expected to vote on the FY 2011 amended budget. We'll also bring you another installment in our leadership interview series. House Minority Leader Robert Brown is scheduled to appear. An in-depth analysis on important legislative issues. Tomorrow, the future of higher education and hope. Plus the latest capital news. That's Primetime Lawmakers tomorrow night at 7. Now, if you'd like to see a repeat of this broadcast, catch it tomorrow morning at 5.30 a.m. on GPB. Coming up next, the best high school sports show bar none. A new episode of GPB Sports Central is ahead, so stay tuned. That's our broadcast for the 12th legislative day of the 2011 session. Thanks to our guests for joining us tonight. For Wandy Lawson and the whole primetime lawmakers team, I'm Scott Slade. Have a good night.
This is a GPB original production. Coming up on GPB Sports Central, a look at one of the top high school teams in the state of Georgia and also the entire United States of America. We'll visit with Southwest DeKalb, a top 10 ranked girls team, Marist Wrestling, and we visit with former Collins Hill women's basketball standout Maya Moore. Plus... And GPB, Sports Central is a slam dunk. So from Aragon to Uvalda, from Junction City to Shelman Bluff, GPB Sports Central is coming up next. Hello again and welcome to GPB Sports Central, the best high school sports show in the great state of Georgia, bar none. We have the best stories, top interviews, and the best insider information. I'll interview former Collins Hill and now UConn basketball standout, Maya Moore. Plus, I'm John Nelson. I hit the trail to the Marist School in Atlanta as the War Eagles get ready for the state wrestling championships. Coach Riddick Beebe has a pair of talented seniors in Connor Carrier and Hunter Bailey. Both with over 100 career wins and both ranked number one and two in school history for career pins. We'll hit the mat at Marist coming up. I'm Mark Harmon. and I travel to Lithonia, Georgia, the home of the high-flying Wolverines of Miller Grove. One of the best basketball teams, not only in Georgia, but in the entire country. Coach Sharman White has put together another outstanding team led by 6'9 junior center Tony Parker. The Wolverines are two-time defending state champs and are working hard as they go for the 3 